Good afternoon. Welcome to session number three of uh, male-female relationships and some new and exciting things that we have discovered over time in understanding the sanctuary and relationships in the sanctuary. God has been able to reveal to us some neat things that will help us in these last days to be cleansed and go through the cleansing and the healing process, not only in our own life with us and God, uh, but also with us and other people. And what's more important than the male-female uh, relationships <clears throat> when it comes to healing? Because that's where family begins, is with the man and the woman coming together in oneness and having their children and those types of things. There's also a lot that can be applied to our parenting skills as well as we learn how to relate to one another. Before we begin, let's have a little word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are here with us and that you have created male and female and that we are to be a reflection of you. And Lord, we have often fallen uh, far short from reflecting you the way that you meant for us to do here on earth. But we are open to listening and hearing your voice and showing us new things. I pray, Lord, that you would just um, forgive me of my sins and cleanse me with the blood of Jesus, that I can be used of you. Just speak through me your words and not my own just now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So kind of summing up some of the concepts that we have been talking about, uh, the bottom line that, uh, of what we've shared before is that in this painful experience between men and women that we have entered into upon the sin problem with Adam and Eve falling together and interacting together with that is that Jesus came to be our Savior in a very special way, not just in a general way, but also with the male-female relationship. And he said that he is uh, the second Adam. And in a very special way, we women need a second Adam in order for us to come back into the Garden of Eden. Women went first with Eve falling into the sin problem, and we need to let Jesus help us to go first back to Eden and to be there for the man. And uh, we, when you think about uh, Isaiah 54, and how Jesus is saying, I can be your, uh, your husband in a very special way. And maybe we can take a look at that uh, briefly. Isaiah 54, where Jesus is reaching out to us to say, I can bring about healing. Isaiah 54 is um, the future glory of Zion. And it starts out by talking about the barren woman and how she is uh, bereaved of her children and that God is promising that you will have your children and to stretch out your tent curtains to make room for the blessings um, and it, for, for children and for a woman. But it's not just for us individually, but the, the church. The, the woman as a church body and how Jesus will bless in a very special way. But then as you go along, we can look at Isaiah 54, verse 4 and onward. I'm just going to keep reading. It says, Do not be afraid. You will not suffer shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young, only to be rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I abandon you, but with deep compassion I will bring you back. In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, Almighty, uh, your, Lord your Redeemer. 
So this is a beautiful picture of what Jesus wants to do for us women as we often feel distressed in spirit or we might feel that separation either from God or from our husbands because of their anger or them being upset at us and this wounds our spirit and wounds our heart and we need to be especially covered with Jesus in order to go forward and minister the way that we need to. Adam and Eve both lost their covering at the fall and so we need that Jesus to cover us in a very special way uh, in order to feel safe and to feel protected as we go forward in the healing and the restoration process. Um, what is sometimes not as clear for us as women and, and vice versa, really the men have no clue how much pain we experience on a daily basis or a weekly basis or whatever it is that we're going through pain because our little spirit is open. We're open all the time to the man and um, if, if we love them and if we are, are there for them and have not closed our spirit yet, we're open and we're just um, vulnerable to the pain that's going on in the relationship. And the man is not necessarily trying to hurt us. They are just being themselves and being upset or whatever, and they're not, it's not against us in particular. But we do feel that wounded experience, and, and you know, Jesus can be that covering for us as we minister and serve. But men also have areas of pain that we're not familiar with, that we have not understood the kind of pain that they have. Now they have a, a place to go so that they can shut down to some degree. Now not that they don't still love us, and, you know, continuously, but we're not able to, to access that. We're not able to connect with their love because they can go into their left brain and uh, which we will explain in just a little bit. They can go in their left brain and just do their thing and go forward and we're feeling cut off and, and they're cut off from their pain at that point too. They're not really feeling the pain of, of things. But if they go into right brain, it's very sensitive and uh, you know soft. They can easily be hurt over there. And so I'll just share that uh, Adam was devastated in the Garden of Eden when he felt like his all that he had trusted Eve with all of his heart in that bonded relationship they had and that when uh, when she went to the tree and experienced all that it was kind of like um, the way men feel when the wife has left and been with another man like he felt cheated on and he felt like now you've come under the allegiance of another you know powerful being and so this caused him great distress and and all the pain just came on his heart that was crushing to him that he lost everything he lost his relationship with God he lost all the beauty of Eden he lost his relationship with his wife to whatever degree and and that pain was just so great that he went further, further over into left brain for protection and ability to just go on anyway in the midst of everything. And the right brain is where there, it's more like a storage area where there's the subconscious. And, but he didn't have to be connected so much with that. And so he could just keep going on. But the pain is still there. You know, it, it didn't go away. And what we women can do is to be a safe place in right brain so that they can come back over into right brain and heal. And so there's many things that, that we need to learn to be able to understand how to relate to him, to not hurt him in such a way that he goes back into left brain. We want him to be able to stay in right brain as much as possible that's right for them so that they can find that healing with us and for themselves and between them and God that it can help restore the years the locusts have eaten. And um, I think that uh, what I can share at this point is that <clears throat> when uh, when we are ready to serve, I was, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but uh, the Lord impressed me how important it was 
that Mary Magdalene washed Jesus' feet first, took that, that appreciative servant role and, and washed Jesus' feet first, not just with water, but with perfume and tears and all of these things. This was really, really a special experience uh, for Jesus, a healing probably of some sorts, you know, the healing of the nations, the healing of what was meant to be. And then he then in turn was able to minister to the 12 disciples and wash all of their feet. Now, if Mary hadn't done it, I mean, he's the son of God, he's God, he could, you know, he didn't have to have that. Um, but it's just a neat picture of that woman going first and then him uh, ministering to the, the 12 disciples who were hearts were completely hard and, and would never have been able to, to, you know, have done that without the spirit of the Lord and the spirit of Christ showing them the way of submission and service and all of these things. And it is our turn as women here in the last generation to play that um, ministry role, that humble role that Jesus went before us to do so that he can use us to reach out to the men, to be a healing agent for them. A healing agent to bring the nurturing, to be able to focus on them and help them. And so often we're so wounded, it's very hard to turn around and minister to them. And that's why I encourage you again to, to find a deeper walk with Jesus than you've ever had before so that you know he loves you, you know he values you, you know the, the, the connection is so deep between you and Jesus that even if you get barbs and all kinds of, of negativity attacking you, you don't have to believe that. You have that shield of faith and shield of protection that you don't have to believe any of the lies of the enemy. Um, once you're, you know, once we're ready to move forward, we feel like, okay, the Lord and I, we're going to do this ministry for my husband or for, you know, it could be other men even. I have a, a brother, you know, sometimes there might be an uncle or other men that you can uh, minister to in the right way. The Lord uh, can use you as a healing agent. So I want to, to bring to you now the fact that there are two languages. There is the male language and the female language. And we do not understand one another. And when we say something, um, he hears something else. And when he says something, we hear something else because we're speaking two different languages and we don't even know it. So the easiest way to solve this problem is for the women to learn male language and be able to go over there into his uh, area, arena, and speak male language with him and also to learn how to interpret what he is saying. And then at that point, the, you know, once the man uh, is able to, to connect and communicate in his own language, it's easier for him to be able to learn the female language very quickly. The further and right brain that they are, they automatically start speaking it again because as we probably all know, they can speak female language before you get married. Did you ever notice that? <laughs> I don't know how they know the language before marriage, but a lot of times afterwards when they go more into left brain and they have lots of burdens to provide and do things, it's hard, they can't access it at that point, the male and female languages. So it's, it's very interesting, but God has a way to solve the problem that, that is actually very exciting. Now, I did read, um, a book, uh, several books um, that actually listed, you know, about male female relations, and it listed uh, in grids he says this, she hears this, um, and then vice versa, she says this, and he hears that. And that was the first time when I started uh, reading those pages in that book. I was like, that's really interesting. Um, and then I could see, and it was just, there was a lot of things uh, that was listed out. And I thought, that makes so much sense because I've heard my parents, you know, talk this way and that way and the misunderstandings that happen, as well as my own relationships. And I thought, that is so awesome. So I took this to the Lord in prayer to, 
to ask the Lord to help me to understand more and more, to be able to decode and to understand where they're coming from. The first thing that we need in order to understand, um, to understand the differences between men and women is to understand the differences between left brain and right brain. So all of us have a left brain, all of us have a right brain, but uh, some of us favor more than the other. Women um, tend to be more right brain, but some of us can have a, a strong left brain. I, I think I'll switch the picture just now to have a visual of, uh, we can use this to be the left brain right here, linear, and this is the right brain, which would be holistic. So, uh, and that even though some men can be more right brain and some women can be more left brain, we have discovered that when it comes to male-female relationships, that the language still applies. It's very, very interesting. Um, so that even though our gifts or personalities may be different, then when it comes to communicating between male and female, we're still on the same, <laughs> the same unfortunate path when we don't understand one another's language. At this time, I'll just go ahead and read to you the differences between left brain and right brain. So this is uh, some research that was done, and so I'll read to you uh, what they had listed. The left brain, or hemisphere, is more linear, which is, you know, a straight line, leadership-oriented, sense of authority and structure, priority-oriented, goal-oriented, time-oriented, problem-solving, and specialization. And words are also in left brain. <clears throat> um, and so some people are like, well, if words are left brain and women talk so much, how does that work? <laughs> but actually, uh, when we're ver we need more verbalization to bring us and our emotions from right brain into left brain. And that's why we find it very satisfying to be able to have extra time to talk. And we need more time to talk in order to verbalize our emotions and really get a handle on what we're thinking and feeling. Then uh, right brain or hemisphere is holistic, nurturing, fine-tuning in relationships, which is awareness of feelings, perception of intuitive truth, sensitivity to emotional factors, awareness of interrelationship of details, spiritual intuitions and connection with God. There is no, uh, oh, and nonverbal cues. There's no words in right brain. So you can see how the goals of the left brain and the goals of the right brain are very different. And this can quickly uh, affect us when we're relating with one another. Um, to move on, I, will, I want to talk about how, um, how important it is that when we're relating to men when they're in left brain, which usually they're in left brain, unless something special has happened to bring them over into right brain, that when we're relating to them, that God is calling us to see him as a king. Now, this is easier said than done. <laughs> it's really important also for us to feel like a queen with our King Jesus and to feel like a princess and to feel the love uh, that he has for us before we can serve appropriately for him to be a king. But a lot of times we, uh, we, we relate to him, to our man, as kind of like a girlfriend. We want to be able to just chat and talk and and we just kind of go around and do our things and everything and he's here and we're here and we're just kind of like we would have a girlfriend in the house. And that is ex very different from treating the man like a king. And so how do we treat a man like a king? <laughs> um, the, the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about kings. And it would probably be good, and I think some in Ecclesiastes, which would have, 
A lot of that was written by King Solomon. And so if you want to do a, a search and look for all the times that it says king in those areas, take note and just put man there. <laughs> just put, because all men were called to be kings. And that's part of their blueprint. And that's why Jesus is king of kings, lord of lords. All men can be kings and is supposed to be kings. And it's interesting because there was, um, my mom was sharing a seminar on male-female relationships. And after the seminar, she heard like a young teenager talking to somebody and saying, I always thought I was a king, <laughs> that I was supposed to be a king. There's something instinctually that's in there that tells them I'm supposed to be a king. So we women, I'm sure that Eve instinctually knew how to treat Adam like a king, but we women have lost that ability and it has to be trained in. So even though that we are equals, this role is a little different between a king and a queen and how they react to one another. Um, so just in, in starting that, how would you treat a king if they came to your house? What would you do? <laughs> I hear that we give food. Absolutely. It's right here on the, on the list. Food is so important to men. And it's, uh, I haven't really asked a man yet, but sometime I would like to, because us feeding a man is, is something different than what we're thinking. I think it's a, it's a really big deal for them. And that's why uh, part of the fall was so tragic because Eve was feeding Adam that that food and it was like some sort of shoe in right there it's like he was way too open for that right because there's some kind of a connection of us feeding a man that is very very important for them to, to feel loved and nurtured and that we respect them and we care and that sort of thing um, so if a, if a king were to come or if we would go visit a king or a president the president of the United States or something of that nature um, the several things would happen. First of all, we would greet them at the door, just like we would any special guests that came. We would greet them at the door when they would come. And this is very important for us to drop everything and go connect with them so that they can start go moving from left brain into right brain so that they need for us to connect with them. And just seeing us Seeing a woman and connecting with our eyes helps to start to move them over into right brain and relax from their busy day and from whatever's happening. And if we're distracted and we're working with the kids and, yo, hi, hon, you know, da -da 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 -da, whatever we're doing, he's, he's feeling shut out from us and he's going to stay in left brain. And if he's feeling needy by the time he gets home, he's frustrated that he's feeling needy and that his wife isn't there for him and then he feels vulnerable and he hates that so it's like oh i'm tough i don't need my wife or whatever it is that they go through when when they're not able to connect when they feel needy for for the female so it's just really um a beautiful thing that we can go and drop everything and greet them at the door and um just like as if jesus were to come to our door we would want to drop everything we can treat our man as as if just the way we would treat Jesus and and how to minister to, to to his needs and it's practice because very soon we are going to meet Jesus face to face I think about that sometime what it's going to be like to look up in the clouds this this God that we've been communicating this shepherd this that has been loving me all these years and we're going to look and we're going to lock eyes one with another and how emotional that's going to be and we're in practice right now as we relate to the the men that are in god's image uh the men that are in our lives and so it it, it doesn't matter how they are treating us we can start out by treating them the way we would treat jesus if he came to our home and so that is um kind of like first number one then uh, number two, I'd put focus on him. Make him your focus. This is not easy, always easy for us, and it's not uh, instinctual. You know, it's not instinctual for us. We want to just flow around like as if another 
girlfriend or another woman is in the house. We just, mm, and he he's, uh, could be talking, he could be sharing something, and, and we're just kind of half connecting or whatever with him. But focus on with eye contact and listening and, and, and make that uh, connection happen. And then of course, offering food because he's probably hungry. Um, and then, yeah, and then be putting him first. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to do that every second of the whole evening or the whole day, but it's, you know, that meet and greet time. It's going to be this connection, this, uh, this bond. And in Proverbs, I believe it's Proverbs and not Ecclesiastes, it says, never leave the presence of a king. And so if they're communicating, like we're connecting, there's eye contact, and he's saying something important, because usually men, when they're sharing something, it's important to them. Um, they don't speak as many words as we do generally. And so it's on his mind, it's on his heart, and so we're going to be listening and waiting until he finishes his thought and finishes where he's at. Then when he's, he's getting filled up by us listening, by us ministering to him, he's getting filled up. And when he's full, then he's going to probably go and get busy with something else. But at that time, we can really put him first and really connect, fill his love cup up um, in this way. Um, I had another thought, but I, I lost that thought. So, <clears throat> so then as we're listening and filling his love cup, then we're actually entering into um, what we have uh, coined a phrase called the ladder, doing the ladder in communication with a man. Now, um, oh, I know what I was going to say, is that we women feel nurtured with each other as we communicate and connect with one another. We feel like we're heard and we can talk back and forth, and that fills our love cups up. But with a man, we, we don't generally listen as, as much as they need for us to listen. We tend to take over the conversation or turn things to in a direction of what's interesting to us. And the latter is going to teach us how to really communicate and how to really listen to the man in our life. Um, I want to explain now, as, as we look at this, how our brains, women's brains, are different from men's brains. Now, this is whether we are a left brain woman or right brain woman or and the same with a man left brain right brain man that that can tend to seem or appear this way or that way it's this these rules apply in any situation um, in communications with men these boxes are, are represent like maybe folders they're little folders of information and women we have lots of folders in our minds and in our brains. A lot of times people have talked about um, women's brains being like spaghetti <laughs> and that it's really hard to follow a thought. And I can understand from a man's point of view mm -hmm. how he would feel like it's like spaghetti and, and it might be, but I think the folder idea is a lot closer to what is happening. So when we are processing information and when we are talking or sharing, um, we have all these individual folders on those topics. And so when we're trying to troubleshoot or figure something out, then we will probably open a lot of different folders because everything is so related and connected in our minds. And so we open a lot. We're trying to figure out something. Okay, so is it this? Is it this? Or how does this problem relate to everything? You know, an example could be if we're trying to work with our children and we've got maybe five children or maybe, you know, as a teacher, you've got 20 children in the classroom. Then you're trying to figure out all how the, um, the problem or the information is going to affect each one of those children. And we're just problem solving and trying to figure these things out. We're consulting emotions. We're consulting the past and the present and the future. Though there is no time orientation here. So everything that happens in the past, present, and future is all has, bears the same weight in our hearts and in our minds. Whereas time orientation is in the left brain. And so we have all this information and we 
uh, uh, we, when we talk about it, we're, we, what I call flash back and forth. Okay, this, 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 and we can just go back and forth between all these folders, all this information, and it's related in our heart and mind. It's all related information. Um, then if we get several women together, it gets really interesting. When we communicate with each other and we can follow one another, we're just right in sync. Then we all have these different folders open. So let's say we have three women. All her folders are open all, and the next woman and the next woman. And now we're sharing, mysteriously so to men, we're sharing all this information back and forth between all of us. All three of us, and if you get a whole room full, it just gets crazy to the man, you know, how we're just going back and forth, but we see how it's related, and we are um, problem solving in this particular way. And, um, but if we do this female way, this is part of the female language, and how all these things relate, we are overwhelming the man, because this is not how he thinks, this is not doesn't make any sense to him and he feels very overwhelmed and he's not seeing the connections between all these different pieces of information and uh, so it gets very overwhelming and confusing and I remember my dad saying uh, when I was growing up and my parents would talk and work things through try to work things through <laughs> before we knew more and more about this and he would he would always say at the end he would always say, you always win. You win every argument. No matter what I say, I can never win with you. <laughs> and I always thought, that's really strange. I, you know, why is he saying that? But it makes so much more sense to me that they just are feeling so overwhelmed and that, that, they, that their concepts and their thoughts don't hold any weight with all the evidence that we can place before them. <sighs> like 20 pieces of evidence so we're like this lawyer or this prosecutor and, and then he feels nailed down, you know, shot down with his ideas. And so we women have to learn how to, to communicate with the man in a way that he can hear us and feel good about it. So the man on the other hand, and we call this the ladder, he it needs to go up his ladder. And he starts out and he wants to take one folder at a time. He just wants to do one folder at a time. And then after he feels completed on that, then he feels ready to go to the next folder. And then the next folder and the next folder. Now what we can do to facilitate him going up his ladder, which if a woman is doing all this right brain stuff, He's shut down. He's not even starting on his ladder. He's just quiet. He's just listening. He's not even starting to communicate and open up and share. Mm -hmm. And so we can um, handle the situation in such a way that he can start opening up his folders one at a time. And so unlike we women who go back and forth and back and forth with information on the same subject, he needs to be able to share his, the entirety of what he's stay, saying and for us to just second witness what he's talking about. For example, we women, when we're flashing back and forth, let's say I'm talking about my grandchild or my child and I share a little story and then another woman will say, oh, my child did that too and when we went to the market, this and so happened and this and that. And then another woman in the room might say, oh, yes, you know, I know somebody who did. And so now we have three stories that are all related. You know, they all have a, a core thought there. But this is very distracting to the man's mind. He cannot keep going up his ladder when we're bringing in information about our, you know, and doing a matching. This is your concept and this is my concept and we're just sharing and matching on the same thing. He is not able to do that as easily, at least when he's in left brain. So what we do is we stay on topic on what he's saying and just second witness that in an affirming way. Uh, so if he wants to share um, about trucking, let's say I know that there, is, um, there was a, a man who was a trucker 
and we were sharing with the wife, um, you know, about the ladder and how to do the ladder. And, and she says, well, I don't, I don't care anything about trucking. I don't want to sit around and listen while he shares all this stuff about trucking. And it's like, well, if you want to reach his heart and you want him to get in right brain, then if that's important to him because it's his job, it's his livelihood, it's what he's doing all day, then that's going to be what you want to talk about or listen, you know, and affirm and work with whatever it is he's bringing to the table. We're going to talk about whatever it is he's talking about until he's all the way finished. So, um, so if he's talking about trucking and then he's going to share, you know, I broke down at exit thus and so and, and, you know, the police had, you know, called in and whatever it is that they're talking about, we're just, we're just being a listening ear and we can say, oh, wow, you know, that's, that's really neat. And, um, that you were able to fix that, or oh, I'm sorry, that didn't happen the way that you wanted. We're not going to start pulling folders from over here and adding to this whole big picture of what he's talking about. We're just, we're just being an active listener with what he's talking about until he's finished it. And then when he feels good about sharing about trucking or what he's done or whatever in, interests him or whatever his job is, which is going to be usually the first thing he wants to talk about, is his uh, career, his occupation. Then all of a sudden he feels ready to start talking about another subject. And so then he'll open another folder. And we want to follow him wherever that conversation leads. And we're going to surround each and every rung on that ladder. We're going to surround it with affirmation. We're going to surround it with love and understanding. We're not going to start in on any of our stuff. <laughs> and we're just going to stay right on, on, on track with him. And uh, the, what I would actually name, if I had to name a seminar about how to, to handle men or work with men, is let him lead. Let him lead. And when we think about letting him lead, I'm not just talking about where we're going to move, what kind of, what are we going to do with the children, but with the conversation. If we let the man lead the conversation every day, every day, every day, he is leading the conversation. He will go up further and further. The next time he talks with you, um, he, he will feel freer and freer to share more of his heart, more of his thoughts, more of what's going on, and he'll know he's safe. He's safe to keep sharing. He has a, somebody who's going to listen to him and always bringing in something with affirming. This is where the sanctuary comes in. I'm going to diverge here for just a moment. The sanctuary is a model for relationships because we are a temple. And the sanctuary is a temple, and there's the temple up in heaven, and we are the, uh, a temple of the Holy Spirit. So we are a temple. And the first way to connect with another, with God, is through the gates of praise. Now, if we're connecting with another person, be it our husbands or anyone or children, that first step through the gate into the heart of that person is going to be words of affirmation because we don't praise people. So, but we can affirm them. We're going to stay on positive. We're not gonna bring negative information in. We're gonna stay on positive and thankfulness of the things that that person has done for us. So we're gonna stay in this positive place with all that we do with the man as he's going up his ladder. Um, one thing we are not going to do is make suggestions. We talked about in another one of the seminars, we talked about how in, for, um, in Timothy, 1 Timothy 2.12, it says that a woman should not, never teach a man. And for a man, teaching is a whole lot of things. And one of them is suggestions. That let's say he's broken down on the side of the road and we have a suggestion of what he could have done to solve this problem better. And so we want to make this, well, honey, why didn't you do this? Or honey, this, or honey, that. Well, you know, with all these suggestions and, and obligations to them and all of these things feel like 
she's in charge, she thinks she's in charge and she's telling me what to do and I can't make, you know, she doesn't think that I'm king enough to make good suggestions or make good choices and to solve problems because problem solving is in left brain. He's a king, he's all about problem solving. He doesn't need the queen to be telling him how to solve problems. So if we have an, a suggestion or idea, we're just gonna keep it to ourselves and just follow his lead. Hmm, I wonder how this is gonna turn out. And I cannot tell you how many times I felt like in my mind, I had a way better idea. This is gonna work way better. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of times that I have thought this and lo and behold, they did, they did a better job. <laughs> it would, no, they come out with something totally different and I followed them and I'm like, oh yeah, this isn't gonna work. Uh-huh, let's just see. Well, when he's ready, maybe I'll show him or whatever. That's us trusting God to lead him. Yeah, that's true. Us trusting God to lead him because God and then the man is, God is the head of man, man is the head of woman. And if we trust, we can even pray, we can go to the top and pray and say, Lord, this is, I don't know, I don't know where we're going with this, but, but then I cannot tell you how many times that when, it, when they, we did things his way, it was like, I can't believe he was right. <laughs> I cannot believe it. And, that, and it's just so amazing. So you can just busy yourself by being curious and say, okay, he thinks this is going to work. Let's see how it is, you know, and just allow him to explore his own ways of problem solving and leading the family and leading um, things together with, with you and, and seeing where it leads. It's going to be a new path that we women would never think up. And I'm going to diverge again and say, how many of us would have thought to fly to the moon? How many women would just think about, you know, like a thousand years ago, let's say, you know, I just really think that we ought to find a way to get to the moon. Or how many women would have thought, you know what, we ought to have a railroad system or a road system that goes all the way from the east coast of America to the west coast of America. I think we can do, I think that would be an awesome plan. I mean, this is not something that women sit around. And if the men who first went in that direction, what do you think the wife would say? You're crazy. You cannot have enough pavement to go from New York City all the way to California or whatever. That's ridiculous, you know. So it's, we have a totally different way of handling life, looking at life. And if they are thinking, let's do this, let's just be curious and see where he's going with it. See what the Lord will do with it and not feel stressed and anxiety like, oh man, this is, this is not going to work and everything's going to fall apart and if you would just listen to me and all this stuff that can end up happening in our hearts if we feel like he's making wrong decisions. But we can also pray that the Lord will continue to lead and if things fail and it doesn't go right, what are we going to do? Are we going to say, I told you so or whatever? See, now honey, if you would have just listened to me, or if you just let me tell you, then it would have. <laughs> but we, what we're supposed to do at every step, every step is affirm and cover for them, for the embarrassment. They are so embarrassed if they try something and it fails. And it's like, oh honey, that's okay, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. I know, we've, I'm sure this or whatever. Just always looking on the hopeful, bright side so that he does not look like a failure to himself and he doesn't look like a failure to you because you're going to cover for him so that he feels good about himself. And you know, when couples are dating in those first months or whatever, a girlfriend is, is likely to do that. You know, she's likely to say, oh, it's okay, you know, and she's just going to be sweet and happy and everything. But once you're in marriage and things go along, it's just so easy to cut him down and take away his manhood and his leadership and his feelings of good about being go feeling good about himself. <clears throat> now, I just want to uh, follow that thought now as he gets more and more used to being able to share uninterrupted, share all his thoughts and feelings. He can even share if he's made a mistake and you're still going to affirm him and lift him up make him feel okay when he made mistakes, he's going to keep going up 
this ladder till he gets to the top. <laughs> and and when he gets to, uh, when he gets to the top, he's ready. Now he feels all finished, he feels all heard. He is ready to go like um, like a, I think of a slide at a swimming pool. He is ready to, to go over into right brain. He's at the top and then he's going to go down the slide and he's going to come splashing down into right brain and be so much more available. And then when he's over in right brain, there can still be, there can be a little more sharing. You, you can't take over and bombard him with all these thoughts or anything, but he, there's still going to be more connection and more sharing back and forth. And, he, and, and a, a greater bonding that can happen between you. Now, one thing that I want to share is that what do you think is the goal, because left brain is goal, uh, the goal is at the top of his ladder. What do you think is all the way at the top that he has this goal when he's sharing this information with us? Something about being the hero? Yes. The Lord, when I really prayed about it, I felt like the Lord impressed me that, that what he's wanting at the top of his ladder is to be a hero in our eyes. And we do so many things to take all of that away from him. We, uh, the, just communicating in, in right brain or complaining or saying, Honey, you didn't do this or whatever. Any negativity. Any negativity is hurting him so bad, you know, that he is not a successful hero. He, we don't see him as capable. We don't think that he's, you know, going to be able to do what he wants to do and wants to be. He doesn't feel like the king anymore. And so when they're down, when they feel that down, then they go and retreat into left brain and they close themselves off to us. And they don't want, they don't, they can't trust us. They cannot trust us with their heart and with their right brain, which is where we want to connect and rebond with them. Because when Adam was, uh, when, when Eve was taken out of Adam's side, it's that soft, gentle part that puts us back together, puts us back together. It's like we're part of his right brain. We're part of the man's right brain. And it's now over here in female. And we want and we long to be able to rebond and reconnect. But it has to be when he's over in right brain, when he's being sensitive and, and, and feeling safe and feeling loving and all of that is where we can reconnect. But we have this huge role of protector for them surrounding that man, surrounding his right brain so that he can feel safe and connect with us again. So we have discovered that when women do this, it works. The thing that amazes me the most is how quickly it works. You know, if women have something in their heart that they're bitter about and they're upset about, it takes a long time for us to heal in the marriage relationship. But what is so amazing with men is how they bounce back so quickly that as soon as we start doing the ladder with them, as soon as we treat them like a king and put our focus and attention and lift them up and, and, and affirm what they want to share with us, then it, you know, sometimes it can happen in just one session, one time that you do this for the man, that, um, that they will respond right away. Sometimes it takes a little more. Now, it may not mean that they talk a really long time, at first, but the more they trust you and the more you do this with them, they talk longer and longer and longer. And then the other thing that happens when they get to the top of their ladder, when they feel like they're a hero in your eyes and they got to share all the burdens of their day and all that's on their minds, the first thing that you could know that he was on, his, uh, on the top of his ladder and ready to come down is that he'll turn to you and say, so what was your day like? How are you doing? What's happening with the kids? You know, and and then you know, oh great, he went. He's all the way to the top of his ladder. He's feeling great, and so it's our turn. And this can happen in a relationship. It can happen faster and faster. But at first, we're going to minister and serve. We have Jesus to share all of our things we need to share. We're just going to serve the men until they can feel safe and they can open up 
and we can dialogue in male language and then he's ready to listen and hear. Now in, in closing on that, I will just say that if you, as you try this with your partner, that, um, that when he turns to you and wants um, to hear about your day, to, that we still have to bring everything as far over as we can into left brain ourselves and not overwhelm him with an ocean of right brain. <laughs> that we just share one piece of information at a time. We only open, that's what they know. That's what they understand. We're just going to bring one folder over here at a time and we're going to share one thing and then let them respond to that and let you know hear how they feel about that one piece of information if we start saying and this and this and this and this and then he shuts down and can't it's too overwhelming for him and the other thing that we're going to do when they ask us about our day is we're going to always keep it positive we're always going to put it in the most positive life light possible this is not a time to say well the you know that door is still broken the kids were a mess and you need to spank them <laughs> and discipline them and thus and so and we're not it's none of this fixing stuff that we want them to do for us that's not you know that's not sharing back and forth now there is a time in the future to do that where we need to troubleshoot and work things through and, uh, and we can talk about that next session but in the beginning we're just going to make it all positive all safe and all light so that they're like wow you know my my wife is happy which is also one of the most important things for them is that I'm a hero if my wife is happy if she's happy I'm a hero I'm responsible for the fact that she's happy he takes full credit for that <laughs> and so we want to be happy we want to show that he is successful and then we have the foundation laid upon which we can build the, ne the next step and the next step for, for complete healing in our relationships. So I thank you all for, for listening. I feel like the Lord um, can really bless us as we move forward to minister to the men, help them feel safe and comfortable, and follow their lead. Never forget, we're going to follow their lead. So let's bow our heads at this time and really ask the Lord to help us know how to do this. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have made male and female so very different, but yet we are both a reflection of the Godhead and of Jesus and, and who he is to us. And Lord, we know that you want us to be in unity, not just male and female, but all your church and all your people to be in unity. But there's nothing more difficult than male-female uh, communication and unity that you want us to have, and we need your help. So we just pray that you will bless us to, and cover us and protect us as we go forward to minister with a right spirit and to listen to your Holy Spirit leading us step by step so that we can help the men in our lives to feel safe and comfortable and open to your Holy Spirit as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.